and then give us a heads up. All right, let's go. worship our king come let us bow at his feet he has done great things see what our savior has done see how his love overcomes he has done great things he has done great You conquered the grave You free every captive And break every chain Oh God You have done great things We dance in your freedom Awake and alive Oh Jesus our Savior Your name lifted high Oh God You have done great Yes and amen, you will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain of God. You have the great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and Uh, welcome, everyone, and welcome to you online joining us as well. It's great to have everyone here on a beautiful autumn morning. We've kind of had a different theme each week uh, this month, and I think our theme, we didn't exactly design this, but today it's the theme is some old faces. Uh, we get to see Sean Roberts, who I'll introduce later. 
It's great to have Sean and Claire and the kids here. And is that Dave Gano? <laughs> That's Dave Gano, too. Thought I was having an apparition. And uh, we also have Rosemary Miller, who I'm going to introduce in a second here. So it's great to have some old faces here. Uh, before I get to Rosemary, I'd love to do just a few announcements here quickly for you. First of all, Parents Life, starting again next week. Uh, so this is 9 a.m. This is only going to run a couple months again. We're trying to build a community of parents. Parents need each other. Come and join us as we talk about parenting challenges and joys and all that. Number two, we have Abington Life Chain coming up next week. Also, that's Sunday, 2 p.m. This is where we go to Abington Hospital near there and have a, a silent prayer for an hour here for the unborn. So please uh, join us for that. Number three, we also have next Sunday, busy Sunday next week, a memorial service. This is Sunday night next week, 7 p.m., special service. We really haven't done this before. It will give anyone who has lost a loved one, and this might be especially relevant with the pandemic, anyone who's lost a loved one, the opportunity to come together to remember to grieve, to celebrate, and to find God's grace and comfort together. So please uh, come to that too. Uh, and then finally, all church picnic. We already did this once this year, and it was awesome. So we said, let's do it again. That's two weeks from today, August 10th, again at Fort Washington State Park. Food, games, kites, hiking, friends, fellowship, one to five. Please come join us. And we have prayer cards over there, but you can ask someone to pray for you. Uh, you know, at the end of the service, don't be afraid to do that. But if you want us on staff or me particularly to pray for you, I'd love to do that. There's prayer cards there. There's also uh, the, the basket there, uh, the, the box for donation or uh, gifts and tithes too, uh, to the church. Um, we're not passing plates. And you can also give online too. Thank you for your continued support. Well, I do want to invite up Rosemarie Miller. Yeah. Now, for those of you who don't know Rosemary, this church was founded in either 73, 1973 or 1974. Seems like there's a dispute on that. But whatever year it was founded, it, the founding pastor was Jack Miller, and Jack passed away in, I think, 96. And uh, Rosemary, his beloved bride, is still here and still serving the Lord in England. And... So we're so thankful to hear an update from you. Well, it's been about a year and a half since I've been here. And every time I come, I think, oh, this will probably be my last year. But here I am. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm just very thankful for the history of this church. In fact, the first talk that I worked on I, I, I sort of uh, gave your history, and then my daughter, Barbara, I have two daughters that mom, mentor me, <laughs> take care of me. So they said, Mom, just tell stories. So that's what I'm going to do this morning. But let me start with a story, story 40 years ago. Well, it was a beautiful evening in Mombasa, Kenya. A group of Muslim women were enjoying time with their children in a small park. I was asked to speak to them, and I froze. I have nothing to say. Fast forward 40 years. I'm in London, seated in a minicab, driving by a Muslim, and I had a lot to say. I usually start by asking them where they're from, and then what do they know about Jesus? Well, they all know he's a prophet and that he's coming again. And that's when the story turns, because they could not accept that Jesus was God. In fact, one Muslim driver said, I am sent to convert you to Islam. And I said, I am sent here to convert you to Jesus. <laughs> well, he didn't take that too well. But. <laughs> so this kinds of co uh, conversations uh, are repeated many times. Well, I wanted to share with you a, a dear friend uh, 
Schminder. She is a widow and has one son who lives in the U.S. And she's rejected the idols of Hinduism and now worships as a present-day guru, which is called Radha Swami. So if anyone asks you, what does that mean, now you know. <laughs> they just don't. They've turned away from Hinduism and Sikhism and now just worship a present-day guru. Well, we met at a group meeting where each one shared what they learned from their guru that week. And Jack suggested I bring my book and share something from the book. <clears throat> but this uh, Shaminder was sitting next to me and read the title and said, well, tell me more. So our friendship began lasting through many years. She loved hearing stories of my family. And one time I brought her daughter's, my daughter Barbara's book, Come Back, Barbara. And since her language is different, uh, uh, she, uh, it was easier for, for me to read to her. So I read her the whole book. And she just couldn't get enough. She just asked question after question. It was just a beautiful thing just to see. Uh, I not only sh uh, sp spent time sharing sharing this with her, but also organizing her bills and her photos and just being a friend. Uh, one day when she was, and she has one son who lives in Delaware, and she asked if she could come visit, and she brought her, her son. So you just never know. The seeds are just planted all over, and God grows them where he wills. Well, I want to share uh, on one more note about Shaminder. I'm never sure how the word reached her heart, uh, and it's not for me to know. And, 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 and now she's uh, passed on, and God knows where she is. I want to share with you Kavita. She's a beautiful woman, a uh, young Asian woman, 35 years old, wanting more than anything else to be married. So our times together were sporadic, but when I lay in the hospital close to dying, she prayed, Lord, I promise to study the Bible with Rosemary if you let her live. <laughs> well, I lived. <laughs> and she was intentional about keeping her promise and studying. So we started studying the Word, and that was a year and a half ago, and since then we have gone through Luke, and now we're in John. She has a lot of issues, very emotional young woman, so she often pray, calls for prayer. It is a, an, uh, an honest relationship, and I'm often as needy as she is. She has grown in her understanding of Jesus, and to me, that's special. Once a year, our American team gets together and walk through the streets of South Hall and pray for, pray for just walk through and pray for the shop owners. So also tracks are displayed on the table and conversations are engaged. This year, with my partner, I walked into a fabric shop and asked the do donors if I could pray that God would bless their business. I don't know whether you could do that here, <laughs> whether they would receive you. But anyway, they were willing. Jack set the example years ago, walking into shops and praying. I really loved doing this. I just had such a sense of freedom when I walked in that tug, and I just knew I should be there. Well, moving ahead uh, north, eight, eight miles from South Hall, and, uh, and we live in a place called Harrow. <clears throat> we have a Bengali neighbor whom we met through our dogs, which is interesting. If you have a dog, it's a good way to meet neighbors. Another way to meet neighbors is to have a baby. So. <laughs> Since then, Ethan is in Calcutta in a large uh, Bengali community, and we bonded. We didn't get out much because of COVID. <clears throat> but a few months away, it was a sunny day. I was posting a letter, and he saw me and motioned me to come over. And, and, and he brought out... So we kept our distance because it was pretty strict. Uh, and, I, and he brought out a small uh, piano stool for me to sit on, very, very small one. Well, when I sat on it, the lid tipped and I fell. <laughs> it was a very soft fall. But, 
But of course, that set me up for being able to talk to him. <laughs> so I said to him, I'm almost died, and I know where I'm going. Do you know? And he shrugged his shoulders and said he didn't know. You know, a lot of people just don't know. When I came out of ICU and moved into a room with another woman, I was still very weak, but knew I should share with her. <clears throat> that morning, one of the aides came into the room singing a so gospel song, which prepared my heart to speak to my roommate. That was very difficult to reach her because there were curtains around and doctors were in and out and nurses were in and out. But I just prayed and asked God for an opportunity. So by that time, I was still, at that, that, that time, I was using a walker. So when the time came, I slowly walked to her bed and said, I almost died, and I know where I'm going. It wasn't a long conversation, but again, another opportunity just to share Christ and grace. Well, there are many more stories. Building friendships is important. One of the ways of encouraging friendship is through our Bible studies in which I teach. We have one Tuesday evening and another Wednesday morning. And now we are in the book of Mark, taking it slowly. Our Bible studies are on Zoom. Women are still concerned about being too close. After our study, we pray for one, or, and one another, still on Zoom. <clears throat> uh, but our friend, Belginger, whom some of you I know have prayed for, our friend who recently lost her daughter, wanted the fellowship, so each week Karen and I would take the computer to her home and sit with her and do the study together. Losing her daughter was incredibly painful, and, and the loss of her son 13 years ago was a grief that almost can't be spoken, and the pain continues. Now she has one son left, but she is so hungry for the word of God and shares her faith with older Punjabi women. Well, this is a small slice of my life. Thank you so much for your gifts and for your prayers. Uh, not, not, not only all of you were here at the beginning of New Life, but as Pastor Mark said, uh, out of the beginning of World Har Harvest Mission and now Surge, we started with two missionaries, uh, two mission fields, Uganda and Ireland. And now we are in 52 countries. Can you imagine? You can imagine. It. Yes, it's worth taking. It's worth tapping for. So thank you, thank you for. I I do hope uh, that that I'd be able to come back again. Uh, I keep saying to the Lord, "This has got to be it," and He keeps saying, "No, you're you're just where you are." <laughs> Uh, thank you for your prayers and your gifts. God bless. One thing I really appreciate about Rosemary's words is uh, not losing sight of the centrality of Christ. Right? Not just God in general or some kind of nebulous religious spirit, but Jesus and Him crucified. I really appreciate her not losing sight of that, and may we be encouraged to do the same. You'll notice I said her husband was the founding pastor of this church. I did not say. He was the founder of the church. For our call to worship, let's hear from Matthew 16 about the founder of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're able, please rise for these famous words from Matthew 16. And Jesus said to his disciples, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but you, my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, 
you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Let us worship. into your glorious light that we may sing the wonders of the risen Christ. May our every breath retell the grace that broke into our strife with boundless love yours and all within its harvest is your own and from your hand we give to you to make Christ known may the seeds of mercy grow in us for those who have not heard may songs of praise build lives of grace to spread your Upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. Show us your ways, O Lord, teach us your paths, for you are God our Savior, and our hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Oh, that's 
We are so happy to have a baptism today. And uh, they, they requested, since uh, Sean was in town, Sean Roberts, that Sean would do the baptism. So I'll, I'll introduce Sean here. I wanted to have him in the bulletin as Sean the baptizer. <laughs> <laughs> Sean was uh, our assistant pastor uh, to youth ministry, to the youth, until 2014. And since then, he has been lead pastor of Christ the Redeemer Church in Portland, Maine. And I, I believe he was your youth leader. You know? yeah. So, so great to have him back. <laughs> and it's not just Sean who is back, it's also Claire. Claire, would you stand up? Maybe, no, she doesn't want to. <laughs> it's so great. 
Uh, Claire was uh, head of our junior high ministry, I believe. You ministered to my oldest daughter for a couple years. She's a junior in college, by the way, now, just to make you feel old. But it's so great to have you and your, your children here. Uh, so I will hand off to Sean. But will the elders come forward too, please, for this? And we're so glad for this joyous event. Well, hey, everybody. Good morning. And welcome to New Life. I am so excited to be here today and particularly excited to be here today um, because of little Theo here. So Theo and I have an interesting relationship. Alden credits the... Uh, credits me with giving Theo stranger danger. <laughs> so this is maybe a little bit interesting uh, for us this morning, but we're really excited uh, to be able to do this and to be able uh, to baptize you, buddy, uh, today. And so as we prepare to do that, let me just offer a few words of um, explanation as to what we are about to do. I know some people may be new to the church. Some people may ask questions or wonder why we baptize babies or even wonder why Christians throw water on each other anyways. <laughs> and so I just want to offer a few words uh, of ex explanation about that. One theologian, Peter Lightheart, says that baptism is the one practice that we do in the church in which the gospel is actually given to us with our name. And the point he's trying to make there is if you look at the Bible and you read all the different passages that are there about uh, the promises that God makes to us, right, they're all essentially for a general audience. The Holy Spirit takes them he applies them to our hearts individually, but they're still pretty general, right? Jesus says, come to me all who are weary, and anybody can respond to that invitation. But the point he's making is that when we baptize, it's that one practice in the church where we will literally say, James Theodore Groves, right? We'll take his name, and then we will baptize him in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And it's really powerful and a beautiful thing for a number of reasons. For one, it reminds us in our own lives, for those of us who have been baptized, that our true identity comes not by the things that I do, but by the name that is on me, right? The name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when I'm tired or beaten down or discouraged or hurting, I can lean back into my baptismal identity and remember where my worth really comes from. It's also important because there are times in our lives, right? And some of us know this, right? countless sleepless nights, countless tears, when our kids may wander away from the faith, right? And we can pray for them, not just thinking about our own fears, but actually thinking and grounding them in the promises of God. And so as we baptize Theo, we are doing something in which we are declaring his truest identity, which is that he is a member of God's family. And that's not the same as saving faith, right? Right? In baptism, the big question always is, who does what? And as Presbyterians, we really strongly believe that God is the primary actor in signing and sealing our identities and our baptisms. And then we respond and reach out and embrace those promises by a life of faith, right? Which is a continual and ongoing thing. And so the question becomes, who does he extend his promises to? And as Presbyterians, we believe that's to people who come to him, right, who profess faith, and faith and to their children, but they are essentially the same. Right? God is still the primary actor in both of those things, and we continue to respond with faith. And so let me just run us through some scriptures quickly to show you that we don't just make this up, but we really ground it in God's word. From the beginning, when God called Abraham, and then again when his son Isaac was born, God's promises were extended to Abraham and to his seed after him. To, so that through them, they might be a blessing to the world, through this one family. Isaac, in that time, during the covenant sign of circumcision, was circumcised in the eighth day, only eight days old. We see it too again in the nation of Israel. There's this interesting passage in Exodus where Pharaoh lets the people of Israel go out to worship, and God says no, because Pharaoh will not let them go with their children. And God says no, your children need to come out with you as well. They continue to signify and seal that their children were part of that covenant. We see it also again in the New Testament when believers come to faith, like in Acts 16, not just individuals, but households are baptized together. In Acts 2, Peter is pretty explicit that the call in our lives is to repent and be baptized, and that this promise is for you and for your children. If it didn't include our children, then then our children not being included in the covenant promises of God would be the only thing 
that isn't in the old covenant that they had that isn't made better or fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It would be the only thing we actually lose. And so we claim these promises as we come in today and as we baptize Theo. And as we do so, there's a call upon the church, right? We vow to teach Theo that he has been set apart by baptism as God's child, that we will pray for him, that we will support his parents. And it's also a great comfort for these guys because baptism is the church's way, too, of acknowledging that we can't do it on our own, that we need each other. And so we're not going to be judgmental. We're not going to look down. We're going to be there to help and support in a world in which there are so many standards and burdens placed upon parents. We say, no, we're here for one another, and we do this together. So here are some words of institution for us. Repent and be baptized for you, for to you is this promise, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God should call to him. To Abraham he said, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God to you and your seed after you. Then Paul to the Philippian jailer in Acts says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved, you and your household. And of course, the verse that defines all baptism is Jesus now victorious over the grave, saying, All authority in heaven and in earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe what I have commanded you, right? That's part of our call as a church. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so Alden and Taylor, now having heard the promises to us in Christ, do you desire that Theo be baptized? Okay. And if you would raise your right hands, if you can do that. Do we do that here? Uh, We don't do that here but we're going to make them do it anyways. <laughs> All right. <laughs> do you acknowledge Theo's need for the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Do you claim God's covenant promises on his behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for Theo's salvation as you do for your own? And do you now unreservedly dedicate Theo to God? and promise in humble reliance upon divine grace that you will endeavor to set before him a godly example, that you will pray with and for him, that you will teach him the doctrines of our holy religion, and that you will strive by all the means of God's appointment to bring him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We do. Awesome, guys. Well, since we're raising right hands, if the members of CTR would also raise your... Or, uh, See, I've done this a bunch. Uh, The members of New Life, uh, please raise your right hands. Do you as a congregation undertake the responsibility of assisting Alden and Taylor in Theo's Christian nurture? And so traditionally, baptism is a time where we declare publicly the name of the child. Again, it goes back to that idea that I shared already. We take his name and then we enclose it. We wrap it through baptism in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so what is the Christian name of this child? Okay. All right, here we go, buddy. In the- <laughs> and now James... Theodore Groves, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and dwell with you now and forevermore. Amen. And now James Theodore Groves is received into Christ's church. And you, the people of this congregation, in receiving Theo, promise with God's help to be his sponsors to the end, that he might confess Christ and come into his eternal kingdom. Jesus said, whoever should receive one such little child in my name receives me. And so Scott is going to come up and pray uh, for Theo and for the Groveses and for all of us.
Oh, my heart's full. Okay, let's uh, let's pray. Father, uh, it's a great uh, it's a great promise that you have given to us and our children um, that uh, if we call on your name, that we will follow you, and uh, and we ask that at this time, um, not only does your spirit uh, rest upon Theo, but to dwell in him, so that like his father and mother, and like his father's father and mother's mother, that he is a blessing to the nations. He is a follower of you, and, uh, and that he brings great joy uh, to his parents' heart. And we ask that we ask that your spirit is upon us so that as we, uh, as we have been asked to help in the nurture and the admonition of this, uh, of this boy, uh, that we do it well and that we take it seriously. But um, what, a, what an amazing thing, Father, the promises that you have given to us and our children and our children's children and to the nations through your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 Hey, buddy. Let's stand together now and sing, Jesus Loves Me. <laughs> Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak. But he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. All right, you can have a seat. Jesus loves me, this I know. We as Presbyterian, can we say amen to that? Amen. amen. Let's pray to God, our Father in heaven. Father, we thank you for being our Father in heaven. You called us to be your sons and daughters. You so dearly love us, have freed us from our sins by the blood of your son, Jesus and have made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve you. Father, we thank you for that privilege, and we worship you and pray that hallowed be your name. We pray that your kingdom continue to come in the lives of the lost and broken around us by your grace, that the gospel reach and transform our neighborhood, community, and families, and the world. Especially we pray for the work of the New Life Nursery School. We pray that this ministry will reach into the lives of our families in our community. And Jesus, his name will be known. We pray for the elders and sessions as they meet this, Friday, uh, this Tuesday and the uh, uh, deacons, deaconesses, and pastoral staff. Father, would you bless them? Fill them with your spirit. Give them much needed wisdom so that they may lead us well in Christ Jesus. We also pray for the, uh, those provi providing mission leadership in various organizations. We think of uh, Bob Osborne, Karen Masso, Mark Davis, Piper Fordham, and the Herons with Search, Allison with Frontiers, and the Salingers. Father, would you continue to fill them with your passion for Christ? and then spirit of wisdom. Father, we are very poor and needy people. And uh, Father, we lift up those, our brothers and sisters who are undertaking cancer treatment. We lift up the uh, Dave McDowell, Chris Reidenberg, who received the surgery and uh, whose kidney needs to function a little better. So would you have a mercy upon her? and Mr. Brown, and Bruce, and Susan Richardson-Paul. 
Father, we pray for healings as they receive treatment. Also pray that your healing power and grace may be displayed in their lives. We continue to pray for Chris Bauer, whose mother Kimberly diagnosed with ALS. Would you have mercy on that family? We pray for Tim and Tina Dimas for their needy for caregiving help for their daughter, Tori. Father, would you come meet their needs? Also pray for those who are grieving the loss of the loved ones. Marcella McNamas, who lost her mother, Melissa Fires and family who lost her father, and then their, I think here, the memorial service was yesterday, and Ralph and Tina Harland, who lost their grandson in a car accident. Father, would you comfort them with your comfort that comes through our Lord Jesus Christ? Now, we, Father, we pray for the preaching and teaching of your word. Would you feel your servant, our brother, John Robert, with your spirit as he brings out your word? Would you give us the ears to hear and minds to embrace and hearts to obey your word? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Right, thank you, Steve, and thank you, Mark, and everybody again for having me today. It is great to see so many familiar faces, and I hope we get the chance to connect after the service. But for now, it's packed service, so we're going to go ahead and jump right in. So our scripture reading for today is found in 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm only going to read verses 4 through 8, but let's stand together for the reading of God's word. <clears throat> Does somebody want to just shout out real quick that the past, I meant to write it down, but what's the page number? 1014. I said 10,014 in the first service. <laughs> Some people were confused, but 1014. All right, First Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. It says, as you come to Jesus, a living stone rejected by men, and in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever, the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Now let me reorganize. Well, about six months ago, Claire and I had the awesome privilege of hanging out with Lily's teacher and getting to be a part of a parent-teacher conference, a good parent-teacher conference, where we, with her teacher, got to delight um, in our daughter. And at the time, Lily was learning how to write stories, and so her teacher comes to us, Mr. Moore, and he says, I really want to read this one story that Lily wrote. She loves her church, and she talks about it all the time, and I think you'll really like it. So I want to start this morning by reading this story to you. And uh, just so you know, it's one of our goals in our house, not to make our kids the brunt of all the pastor stories. <laughs> and so we treat it as her intellectual property, and this is with her permission, and she's a stone-cold negotiator who is $10 richer. <laughs> but this is, <clears throat> this is what it says. All right, I don't think you'll be able to see it, but maybe you can make it out. It says, they all start this way. It says, today I'm going to teach you all about my church. My church is called Christ the Redeemer. Right. This one is about our nursery, so there's a toddler in jail. <laughs> it looks <laughs> over here. And, uh, you know, carriage, uh, hovercraft. But it says, but this is what it literally says. It's about our nursery, but it literally says, my church has a rum for babes, and babes love it. <laughs> it goes on. 
My dad is a pastor. A pastor is someone who owns the church. <laughs> and the final page is Taylor Swift is one of the most sassy singers in the world. <laughs> And so today I'm going to teach you about my church. My church is called Christ the Redeemer. My dad is a pastor. A pastor is someone who owns the church. One of the fun things about being a guest preacher is that I get to be a sort of, in, come in from the outside and just be a sort of encourager for today. But as I thought about coming back to new life after having been away for so many years, this passage in 1 Peter chapter 2 quickly came to mind. It wasn't the first one I was wrestling with, but it quickly came to mind because it's a passage about the church, but not just the church uh, theoretically, but the way that Jesus himself actually works within his church. And for Christians, as we look at the way God works within the church, we learn something about the way that he works within our lives. In fact, sometimes it's hard to make really fine distinctions between the way God works in the church and the way he personally works in our lives. Um, because when he works in the church, we as individuals are shaped in some really profound ways. No Christian is an only child. And so it's important for us to kind of see the way he does that, that without Christian community, no matter how spiritual we might be, no matter what our personal experiences are, we will inevitably be malformed as Christians. On the flip side, though, when he works within us, as personal as that work may feel, he is doing something also in building up his church. And of course, we're having these conversations within what has been a very crazy year, from a global pandemic to navigating some really complex conversations in a polarized culture and a, on a variety of complex cultural issues. I know that you guys have experienced this as we have as well. And we're doing so at a time where culturally, if we're really honest, humility and careful listening, counting others as more significant than ourselves is in short supply. All the while for the church trying to maintain an essential unity that's in Jesus Christ, right? And so this is the challenge. In our church, we talk a lot about unity without uniformity and diversity without division. But it's especially tough when we're tired, right? It's tough all the time, but it's especially tough when we're tired. One pastor friend of mine in Pittsburgh recently described how he was feeling as a tired that settles in your bones that time off doesn't fix and that sleep doesn't cure. Maybe you can relate to that. And in moments like that, what is the tendency in your life and in your heart? I know that for me, that tendency that I always move towards is to try to exert control. And control can look a couple different ways in our lives. We can try to take control of our circumstances and try to change them around on the one hand, or we can come in through the side door and find other things in our lives that we can control because this thing, thing over here seems out of control. Or we can chase after comfort because it gives us a semblance of control, right? And so we find ourselves as there have been a lot of articles written over eating and over drinking and watching lots of Netflix or whatever it might be. So it's not surprising that a seven-year-old growing in awareness would look at her pastor who, or look at her father who happens to be a pastor and quickly conclude in the midst of all of the chaos and the crisis and the exhaustion that he must think he owns the church. First Peter 2, I believe, is a liberating corrective for us. I believe First Peter 2 actually gives us some words of freedom that free us from all those false and functional Jesuses that we often try to run after. And instead, it confronts us with the real Jesus who actually owns the church and actually builds the church. I thought Mark made a great distinction today when he talked about Jack Miller as the founding pastor and not the founder of the church, because Jesus is the founder of the church. And, at this, and in this text, we see at one and the same time, he is both its strong builder on the one hand, but also the, the one who grounds it as its cornerstone and foundation. And so today, what I want to do is I just want to look at three quick things. It's really a one-point sermon with two implications in a story, but... <laughs> It's a one-point sermon with two implications, but here are kind of the three headings to follow along as mile markers along the way. The first is that we see a contrast between stones and builders. The second is we see the problem of being a builder. And the third, we see the grace of being a stone. All right, so first we see a world of stone and stones and builders. Our text this morning is clearly dense and has a lot in it. 
In fact, I often think of coming into 1 Peter chapter 2 as walking into an art museum and trying to take in all the different pictures at all the same times. In very quick succession, Peter gives us stones and builders, priests and sacrifice, and then a little bit later, light and darkness and travelers on a journey. And so today, what I want to do is not try to do too much and just dive into one of those illustrations, which is that of stones and builders. And I do this not by choice because I like that more, but if you actually read the text from verses 4 through 10, you begin to realize that it's pretty clear that the stone and builder imagery is the dominant image in this text. In short, what Peter is doing is he is taking temple imagery from the Old Testament, this idea that God promised to dwell with his people. He's taking that temple imagery, right, reflected in the tabernacle and the temple, but now instead applying it to the church in such a way that he makes a really radical claim. It's a claim that I think for those of us who have been around the church for a long time, we maybe struggle to see. But it is a radical claim because what Peter is saying is that God now doesn't dwell in some temple somewhere like almost everybody in the ancient world believed, but that God dwelt in and amongst his people by his Holy Spirit because of the finished work of Jesus Christ. That despite all of our imperfections and our flaws and our brokenness, And we know how messy church can be, that despite all of that, he chooses to live with us, even as broken as we are. And that image is that God is present with the church, and he is building that church right in the midst of the world, which automatically will create conflict, right? Because our claim is that Jesus is Lord. And so when Jesus is doing a work within his church, within a world that doesn't acknowledge him as Lord, it will inevitably create conflict. Conflict, But notice that conflict, the true conflict, rests squarely. Peter is really clear about this. It rests squarely not on our preferences or the things we like, but it centers on the person and the claims of Jesus. And so in verse 4, we see what we already know, that Jesus by his very nature and by his claims is polarizing. Right? And so in verse 4, it says, As you come to him, Jesus, a living stone rejected by men. Right? We already see some polarization there. But in the sight of God, chosen and precious, And then we look at verse 7 and 8 and we see, so the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected, again, polarization, has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. And so he's polarizing. But I want you to notice that place where polarization actually happens. I want you to see why he's polarizing because it's not where we might naturally assume. And so if we look at the text, we see very clearly that there's this contrast at play between these living stones that are being built up and these builders who are rejecting Jesus. Did you notice that? It's easy to miss, right? Those who are coming to Jesus are described as stones that are being built. Those who reject Jesus are described as builders. And to make his case, Peter actually applies the language of Psalm 118 and of Isaiah 8, to make that point, the stone that the builders rejected. And so we have this contrast, right? It seems that Peter is saying that we live in a world in which there are one of two types of people. On the one hand, there are those who are coming to Jesus and they are being built, stones. But on the other hand, there are those who are building, looking out there somewhere for the raw materials of life upon which to build their lives. And so by implication, we see that everybody is engaged in a building project. One is being built, one is building. And he describes it in that whole process as Christians being living stones. That's how he describes this. Never once in this whole text are Christians described as builders. We're described as stones. And at first that seems all right until you realize that stones are really boring (laughs) and they're not very interesting, right? I mean, you think about stones maybe out in a field that they're muddy or they're hidden And they are, by their very nature, uninteresting things. I mean, the lamest pet in the world was that fad in the 80s. You guys remember pet rocks? So you put like googly eyes on it and everybody's like, oh, I have a pet now. But that's not the case. Stones are, by their very nature, boring. Which is why even with the most precious stones that we have, we tend to take them and fashion them into something beautiful. We put them in jewelry or something else. And so the power of this image is that when we come to Jesus, Jesus takes that which is not very interesting on its own and refashions it and repositions it into something beautiful. St. Patrick in his confession, the sort of one thing we know that he wrote, and and I encourage you to read it. I mean, he is very grace-driven all throughout. He describes grace in his life in this way. Here's his testimony. 
He said, I was like a stone lying deep in the mud, right? Boring. And then he who was powerful came, and in his mercy, he pulled me out, and he lifted me up, and he placed me on the top of the wall. That is why I must shout aloud in return to the Lord for such great good deeds of his here and now and forevermore which the human mind can't understand. And so this is the starting point in the storyline for all Christians, that somehow in our lives, by our very nature, our identity is something along the lines of Jesus took that which is old, that which is ugly, that which is cracked and muddy and broken and sinful, and he positions me together with others, that he is making into something beautiful, a very place where he dwells with his people, into something where despite all of our present faults, he desires to dwell. And so the power of this image, of course, is that the church ultimately rests not on us, but on him, because he's the one that's doing the building. The weight of the church rests on him. You see that both in this language of building and in the language of cornerstone. And I say it because I think it's easy to forget. I know it's easy to forget in my context. We talk about this a lot, again, in my church as well. It's easy to forget, especially in moments of crisis, and especially in moments when we're suffering or we're tired, because in those moments, all of the inertia and the gravitational pull on our lives is to turn inward, right? Not outward or upward, but to turn inward, to then begin to be driven by self-concern, because it's hard. It's hard to think of others, right, when we are suffering. I remember once Terry was counseling somebody here in the office, and this person was talking about their problems, and Terry said at some point, Okay, now I want you to pray for this other person who is struggling with cancer. And it's a powerful moment because in our suffering, we have a hard time looking at others and looking up. But this says Jesus is the true cornerstone, that he's the one that we actually find a rest in. We don't have to have it all together. We can struggle. We can suffer because it doesn't rest ultimately on us. We can go through the things everybody is feeling, but the thing that distinguishes Christians is that there's a through line of confidence, and there's a through line of rest because our lives are not built on our own strength. They're built upon Jesus Christ. The same is true, obviously, too, of the church, which brings us to our second point, the problem with being builders. And so I can't stress it enough, right? Peter never once calls believers builders. He calls them priests. He calls them worshipers. We'll come back to that at the very end. And there's obvious activity and a calling and work to do within the life of the church, but never once does he call Christians builders. And we could actually go so far as to say that's the old way of thinking about our lives, right? The very thing that the gospel frees us from. Builders are marked by striving, but stones are being fashioned into something new and something beautiful by a strength that is outside of them, that is bigger than they are. Builders are building. Stones are being built. One is working really, really hard. The other is finding belonging, a place to rest. The striving has ceased. One is exhausted. The other is learning what it means to glory in weakness, to find strength where he has none on his own, to be interdependent upon others and interconnected with others also on the same journey of following Jesus. And so if we really scratch below the surface, what we see that Peter is addressing here are some very essential and crucial things about Christian identity. That as Christians, one of the central claims of the Christian faith is that our identities are not made or built or created for ourselves. One of the central claims of the Christian faith is that our identities are given as a gift of God's grace. They are not chosen. They are declared over us. That the truest things about us at any given moment in time is not how we feel about ourselves when things are going well or things are going poorly. It's not the internal conversations we have with ourselves. It's not what other people are saying. Right? People can accuse you of all sorts of things. It's not even about how you feel. The truest thing about us at any given moment in time is who we are in the heart and the mind of God, the things that he has declared over us, that he has set his affection on us, and that he views us as his beloved children. And that can never be taken away because it's one for us in the finished work of Jesus Christ who's victorious over the grave and is seated on high, all right? That's the beauty of what's signified in baptism, that he takes your name and he wraps it, right? Because of our union with Christ, it is brought into what C.S. Lewis calls that Trinitarian dance. It is brought into the life 
of the triune God, that I, Sean Roberts, bear the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, not because I'm divine or anything, but because God has given me my identity, and my identity is found through my union with Christ. And that's a counterintuitive narrative in a lot of ways, because everything in our lives tells us that we have to build our own lives or choose, um, or, or that our lives are made, or that we have to accumulate, or that we have to accomplish. And the problem with building is not just that the Bible tells us that that's not the way the gospel works. The problem with building is that it never works because it creates unstable identities. It has to, because sometimes things go well and sometimes things go poorly. And the good news that the church has to proclaim in this moment in our culture and what we forfeit when we get distracted by other things, the good news that we have to proclaim in this moment is that Jesus actually gives us the identity that we so deeply long for, not because we earn it, but by a gift of his grace, right? That from very young ages, instead of what we are taught, right, which is why when we baptize Theo, it's really important that we think about her vows, not from a very young age that we are pushing against what we are taught within our culture, right? That the narratives both traditionally and in their modern reconceptions are still essentially, if you work really hard or if you choose the right things or you make the right decisions, then you're going to be happy, in life. Lots of parents talk to their kids about, about if you don't get good grades. I remember this happening for me when I was a kid. My parents saying, if you don't get good grades, you're not going to be happy in life or whatever, right? But that's the narrative that comes up over and over and over again, right? That if we're going to be happy, we have to make the right choices. We have to work really hard. We have to choose the right things. We have to build it for ourselves. In other words, be a good builder. And there's an incredible amount an incredible amount of pressure that comes with that. Not to talk about even just assuming it has an assumption that we would actually choose if we had the power the right things for ourselves or the things that would actually make us happy. Right? It assumes that we're capable of that. But even so, there's an incredible amount of pressure. And as a result, our churches and our neighborhoods are filled with people who are overwhelmed and anxious and disillusioned. I have conversations with this all the time, about this all the time within my church and with my neighbors, even those who are not interested in Christianity at all. Because we're anxious and we're overwhelmed and we're disillusioned. These things that we tell ourselves about our lives don't add up. And so here's the big problem. If we have to build our own lives in our own strength and in our own striving, it means that ultimately we will be evaluated by the beauty of what we built. It means that ultimately we will be evaluated by outcomes. But again, the problem is that that's unstable. And so when things are going well in my life, I feel great. And when things are going poorly in my life, I feel terrible. Right? And so life goes like this. We kind of go on this emotional roller coaster instead of being like this. And then when we're tired or we're suffering or we're struggling and that inertia begins to pull us inward, that becomes exacerbated. It becomes something more like this, right? Instead of like this. Because we can't create stable identities for ourselves. And so that brings us to our third point, the beauty of being a stone. And so as Christians, we have good news, as good news and as lovely news and as beautiful news for our culture as it has been for any culture in the history of the world ever. The world is filled with bad news. We just call it the news. <laughs> but the gospel tells us that we have good news to proclaim. And so our witness cannot be about being right or it cannot be about, you know, Christians holding to, the, to truth in these certain ways. We do hold to truth, but it's because we believe that it's true, but also that we believe truth is beautiful because truth connects to who we are as people and who God created us to be. We have to move out from the firm conviction that in Jesus we actually have news that gives life and that gives freedom to people, that sets people free because we actually believe him to be the hope of the world. And that without him, there is really no hope for our world. And so Scott Sauls, in an article that we make all of our new members read in our church, it's entitled, A Jesus-Like Church Culture. He says, the dominant view that our neighbors have of Christians is that we do not like them. Which is tragic, again, if we really have good news that gives life. Because the beauty of the gospel is that God doesn't relate to us that way. God doesn't relate to us based on outcomes. God relates to us based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. And that's a powerful and, again, a beautiful thing. 
It's startling here, I think, in 1 Peter chapter 2, that when, Jesus, when Peter speaks of these stones, it's almost completely passive. He talks, the only active thing he really talks about is us coming to him. And then in verse 7, to believe. It's a reiteration of the fact that Jesus is the one who works in us to will and to work his pleasure. It's a reiteration of the fact that we are saved by grace through faith alone. Grace reminds us that God's love for us is not based on our efforts. That in moments of great success, he loves you. And in moments of great failure, he still loves you. And in moments when things are going well in your life, or in moments when you are really struggling and you don't really even know how to get out of bed in the morning, he still loves you. And in his love and in his grace, our identities find stability that can never be taken away. And so more and more as I've been a pastor and just a Christian who struggles like everybody else, more and more I've come to the realization that I don't actually think we can really come to a real understanding of the fact that God loves us without a big view of grace. And I got this from Jonathan Edwards a number of years ago, I think in the third floor office that I used to have here somewhere. I can't remember which sermon. But in one of the sermons, he says something like, if God were to relate to us based on our productivity or our outcomes, then he would essentially be relating to us not as persons, but as machines. Because that's how we relate to machines. And so in our office in Portland, Maine, we have a copier. It's an awesome copier. All right, it does some things that I didn't even know copiers could do. It takes different pages out of different trays of different ways. It staples them. It folds them. It does all of these really cool things. But it's the third copier that we've had since I've been the pastor of CTR. We keep upgrading, right, because eventually they break. And eventually there are better models, and we can then upgrade. And so imagine if God related to us in that way. Imagine if God related to us based on productivity and outcomes. You would never know he really loved you because when things were going well, then yeah, of course, I'm so lovable, right? But when things are going poorly or when something happens in our life where we can't produce in the same ways or where we're really struggling, right? Then we wouldn't know if that love would stop. Why wouldn't he stop loving us if it was based on outcomes? But the beauty of the gospel is that he doesn't relate to us that way. Why does he love you? I don't know why he loves us. But I think the only answer is, ultimately, I mean, we know he loves us in Jesus Christ and is clothed in that way, but I think, but he said, but the Bible teaches us that he loved us even before that, right? God so loved the world that he sent his son. Why does he love us? The only possible answer to that question is that he loves you just because he actually loves you for no other reason. And again, I think that's, an incredibly powerful thing in our culture. Because if we think about it, we can't even live up to our own standards that we have for ourselves. And how many of us have dreams of certain things? I mean, I've been wanting to have a six pack since I was in high school. (laughs) And that's a long way away, (laughs) right? We can't even live up to the dreams that we have for ourselves, yet alone the dreams or the standards of perfect righteousness and holiness that God has for us. What then? The gospel says he loved us when we were dead no accomplishments or reputation or rights. And we can use lots of other illustrations. The gospel says we have to be born again. What do babies not have? Essentially anything. We have no resumes. We have no accomplishments. The Bible goes even further. When we were still enemies, Christ died for us, that he loves you to the point of shedding his own blood. And in fact, we could keep going. Right again, we come back to that language of being dead, this ugly, uninteresting stone, and Jesus makes us alive which means that you can be confident he loves you because he's clothed you with the righteousness of his son whom he did not spare, right? He has clothed you with his precious son in our creeds, we say, who perfectly paid for all our sin with his precious blood and he has set us free from the tyranny of the devil. And so union with Christ means that if we're truly united to him, it means that when God looks at you, he sees the beauty of of his beloved son, and he looks at you with all the affection that he has for his son. And then when he looks at Jesus, he sees you and I connected there and incorporated there. And we too receive that affection and that beauty of being his beloved children. It's a powerful statement. And so I want to close with this because I think it's hard for us to believe. And I'll tell you that I know it's hard for us to believe because I have a hard time believing it. 
When I first went to Portland uh, eight years ago, I wasn't 100% sure that I was ready for that, <laughs> to, take, <laughs> to take that job. And Terry was really, Terry was uh, uh, the former pastor here, was really encouraging it. And I talked to a number of other people in my life who are on staff here who mean a lot to me and who were real spiritual influences in my life. Mark Davis, Dave Gano, who's over here today, uh, Nancy Bauer, Martha Cochran. And they were more encouraging than I was <laughs> of myself. But I, but I kind of wanted to do it, and I thought it would be a great challenge, and I felt God was calling us there. He just kept opening these doors. And yet when I got there, I thought, small church, going to have lots of time to pursue Jesus. <laughs> nope. <laughs> it was busy. It was a lot harder than I ever thought it was going to be. Plus, when you're looking at a new call, you know, God tends to maximize all the good things. <laughs> and then, you know, six months, a year later, it's a lot harder. And so we went. And somewhere along that way, right, what, I, what people had been seeing in me here, which is sort of a personal revival of wanting to spend time with Jesus and then to minister out of that place, somewhere along the way, that began to turn. And I started ministering a lot more out of my own strength. And you can do that for a little while. I did that for two or three years before it all finally came to a head. And I remember it came to a head in a lot of different ways, but there was one day in particular where I woke up in the morning and I was exhausted and I checked my email and then I couldn't stop crying. And I cried and I cried and I cried and I just could not stop. Claire thought something was really wrong with me because something was really wrong with me. <laughs> and I don't, because I don't, I mean, I'm not much of a crier or emotional in that way normally but I couldn't stop. And so she had her dad call me, and her dad called me. He kind of walked me through it. He said, where do you like to go? Like, where is the place that you like to go where God really ministers to you? And I was like, well, I can go sit on these rocks in Maine and stare at the ocean. And he said, okay, go there. And so I went there, and yet I was crying on the way there. I was crying when I got there. And finally, I got through that day. I sort of pushed through the weekend, right? It was a Friday. I pushed through that Sunday. And then on Monday, I call my deacon, and I say, John, I really need to get out of town. Can I use your little place on a lake for a three-day retreat? And I got there, and I sat on the Adirondack chair, and I opened my Bible, and it fell to Psalm 103, which says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. And I looked up after I read that across this little pond in Maine at this tree, actually at this like grove of trees. And I was really struck by how long those trees had been there and how strong they were. And I don't know why that was. I'm just telling you what happened. And it felt a little bit new agey, but in that moment, <laughs> but in that moment, Right? I'm too Presbyterian to believe that. And so let's just say God was using a combination of general revelation and spiritual and uh, special revelation, the book of creation and his word. But in that moment, it dawned on me that something had been vacated from my life and that something was adoration, worship. Right? The word that came to mind was adoration. And of course, I prayed about that for a little bit, that somewhere along the line, I had lost a sense of the bigness of Jesus. And I thought it was about me and building this church, and fixing this church. And so I prayed for a little bit, but I didn't even know where to start because, again, I was exhausted and at the end of myself in a lot of ways. So I went back inside, and I pulled out my iPhone, and Spotify recommends uh, Sovereign Grace's song, How Firm a Foundation, which is written by Anne Steele, one of the great hymn writers, and thus, right, like all hymn writers, one of the great influencers, teachers, shapers of the English-speaking church. And this is what she says, right? She has a line where she says, What more can he say than to you he hath said, than to you who to Jesus for refuge have fled? And then later, he will be with thee in trouble to bless and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. And I'd love to say that from that moment on it was better, but you know the way that that works, right? My heart is too sinful. And the Christian life is not a straight line. But the fact of the matter is that there was something there that in my life dawned on me that in these moments of great exhaustion and of tiredness, what we need more is not doing more and trying harder, but Jesus. 
he needs to become bigger. Right? We could even use the words of uh, John the Baptist. Right? I was already referred to as a Baptist, so <laughs> my kindred spirit. <laughs> John the Baptist says, I must decrease, and he must increase. And that's the powerful thing about the gospel. That's why I think worship is at the center of this text. It makes us, right, what does it say here? It says to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices. Worship and adoration is the best prescription. It is the ultimate vaccine for a tired and an anxious and an overburdened and a fearful heart. And Jesus is faithful. Right? You don't need other functional Jesuses in your life. You have the real Jesus, and he's better than all of those other things. He's way more and way more sufficient than anything you could think or ask, and he loves you. And through him, the Father has declared over you an identity that has already been won through his precious blood and that can never be taken away. And so we can be confident in the ups and downs of this year. Who knows what's going to happen going forward? But we can be confident that as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house. And he is the cornerstone, chosen and precious, that whoever believes in him will never be put to shame. Let's pray together. And so, Father, we thank you once again for your word, and we thank you for the way it leads us to repentance. Lord, we thank you for the way that the gospel really does that in our lives that it calls us toward repentance, that it deconstructs us and breaks us apart, often in ways that are hard for us. But then it builds us into something more new and beautiful through Jesus Christ and through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that's an incredible thing to really think about. Father, we thank you that Jesus is faithful, that you are faithful, that we can rest in his faithfulness, and that because of him, our identities and thus our hope and our future is absolutely secure. And we thank you that he builds the church because we know we cannot do it on our own. And so, Father, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the way that you use this church in my life as I grew up in some ways into ministry. And we pray for your blessing over them, that you might continue to do that work of building your church. We thank you and we praise you that it's done solely by grace because we know ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Will you stand and let's worship. Let's adore the Lord together. How firm a foundation you saints of the Lord is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? To you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. To you who for refuge to Jesus have fled.
one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not try. trusts in this chosen and precious cornerstone will never be put to shame. So let us never trust in any but Christ. Let us never boast except in the cross of Christ.
this word of God's blessing. Am I on? All right. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and dwell with you now and forevermore. Amen. 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 Well, thanks for having me again today. Uh, I will be up here in the front and would love to greet some old friends and meet some new faces. Woo! <laughs> 